has heard of it because you can't really sloganise no to, no to TTIP, everyone sort of trips over it, as I just did there, ironically. Um, but th there's a serious point. How do, you, how do you stop it when you're locked in? And the thing is you do it. You do it. Because it requires a lot of bravery. It does require a lot of bravery, but at the moment we haven't got a government, and we haven't had a government in my lifetime, sadly, so I could be more depressed than you know, most people in the room, I think. Um, <coughs> that has had bravery, that has tried to renationalise anything, that has tried to bring it into public ownership. But actually, if you look in Europe, yeah, apparently, according to European law, gas, water, electricity has all got to be in the market. It's not. And they just ignore it, and they carry on and keep it in public ownership. True of a lot of the railways as well, actually, mm. throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, what are they going to do? You know, is somebody really going to invade us on this? You know, is, is America going to sweep through with its forces because we've renationalised our railways? So the ISDS so. is the big thing. No, I agree. I yeah. agree. And it's a serious thing and we should oppose it. I'm not trying mm. to make light yeah. of you, but what I'm saying is until you've got a government that's even prepared to fight it, if you look at what's gone on within the EU and within trade negotiations, it's been the British government that's been pushing it furthest in that direction, mm. most enthusiastically, mm. further than everyone else. And that's why we do it. We've normally done it before everyone else mm. has been forced to by these treaties. But actually, if you look at most of the rest mm. of Europe, they haven't done it. They've just ignored it and just gone, you know what, we're going to keep our gas, and if you're going to privatise yours, we'll get our gas company to go over there and repatriate the profits, mm. thank you very much, which is a very sensible and rational thing to do. So, to me, mm. the first question is, let's have a government that's prepared to do those things, that is going to do those things, and put the question out there, and then let's see what happens, because I'm pretty confident I don't think the EU's going to do much about it, frankly. Right. Mm. Maria? Yeah, just, uh, just uh, two things. But back, uh, back up what um, Andrew is saying there, I mean, it does, it must be a British deference to experts to tell you, that, you know, yeah. this is, you know, this is how it should be, and uh, you're right, I mean, if people ignore it in Europe, and yet in Britain, people seem to say, oh, you can't do that because of Europe, or you can't do that because, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond the, you know, the Treasury says you can't do that, uh, you're going to pay bankers mm. their bonuses, otherwise they might, you know, you know they mm. might, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's just absolute rubbish, mm -hmm. I really do think, that we need to popularise the lesson of the world economy of 2008. These people are experts who set all these things up like that. It, 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 it did work. Yeah. And they nearly, you know, they were saved by uh, states, government, mm -hmm. putting money in, which they had to, otherwise the whole system would have gone. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, we, we did that much, right. Mm -hmm. What we didn't do was take over. Uh, and that's the problem. And the last thing <coughs> is, I mean, that's, I think we're all on the same page here, so I don't need to, I don't need to emphasise it. And we have to all know that whether private sector trade unions, public sector trade unions, and I think a lot of the same things are at play. I've got one last thing to say to add to Janine's uh, uh, um, get rail nationalisation. The what's it called? Grilla. 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 Well, there's of course the uh, demand of Labour Party conference last year to uh, to Grom Grill, which is to <laughs> get <laughs> Royal Mail <laughs> renationalisation <laughs> in Labour Party. Can I add that to your list? Is that yeah. Okay? Yeah. So don't take <laughs> So just remember that though. The Labour Party has also spoke about Royal Mail nationalisation. <laughs> Quickly jumped on immediately by the Labour spokespeople afterwards. But the reality is, it's, it's just as popular. People know it's necessary, um, and uh, and uh, we need to add that to the list. So we got Ron Wilm as well as Willem. Yeah. And as Ron Wilm. They're clearly characters in the third film of the Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't seen yet. Janine, is there anything you want to do? See you on the picket lines. I imagine within about a month. So. <laughs> John, if yours are sooner, I'll see you there as well. <laughs> yeah. John. Um, on to, to, there has been a debate in Parliament. Um, John Healy led the debate, which was quite, quite remarkable, actually, that John mm. Healy took it up, because he's not <laughs> known to be on, on the left on, on any particular issue. But I think there is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a growing awareness of its implications. We've been running this series of meetings in the Commons called People's Parliament, and it's, it's been a running theme at a lot of those meetings. Uh, and a lot of young people are now move, mobilising around the different groups. And I think it get increasingly in civil society organisations are beginning to wake up to it too. So I think there's a campaign potential building up in the way there was around the GATT talks and, and elsewhere. So I'm hoping that will come to fruition. There hasn't really been a proper discussion with the Parliamentary Labour Party yet. Um, we're, they're the last to debate these issues, but I think it's growing. Um, I just want to emphasise the... Um, the critical nature of the next few months, really. The, mm. the National Policy Forum meets in a month's time. Um, the policy papers are out there for consultation. Um, they're completely innocuous. Um, and, that's, and I'm not going to swear tonight. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you look at them, they're, they're almost meaningless in some areas. Mm. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of them. Um, 
um, <laughs> and they're almost meaningless in some areas. John Crudus's work with the, uh, is coming out shortly as well. And, I, and again, that might be a bit more helpful around, particularly issue around democracy, etc. I'm not sure about public ownership, but it's all written up in A-level sociology, so no one can really well understand the stuff. Um, so I think there's a sort of a vacuum there that needs to be f filled, and the best way of filling that, I think, is a sort of a campaigning approach to raising issues, and that means I think individual unions campaigning. The, trying to drive things to union conferences, to, through the TUC as well. But I also think it, uh, there's time now on some of these issues, just as, as we've done for DFAT, that triangle, WOW, and all the rest of it, there are elements of direct action in some of these campaigns. You know? mm. And the effect of direct action against ATOS by the disabled, well, DFAT and others, I think really tipped it over the edge. And I'd like to see, and um, we need to be creative about this, some elements of, of more direct action around some of these privatisation issues. It would, look, it would be really good to, for example, at a number of these company a AGMs to expose, sorry about this, John, the bastards, basically, mm. and how much they're making. And again, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think a number of us need to think, all of us, I think, need to think through this next few months about how we can raise these issues most effectively. To, to get them on the agenda of the Labour Party. Because at the moment, there's almost a quiet acquiescence that will roll into a general election in relative comfort, if you like. We've got to shake the Labour Party leadership out of that comfort zone. So we've got to educate, I think we've also got to educate the Labour front bench. There's a, there's a very, I don't say it's in any patronising way, but there's a very inexperienced Labour front bench. When I say inexperienced, I don't mean in terms of policy development, they've all been policy wonks or whatever. I just mean inexperienced in the real world. Yeah. I don't think any of them at the moment come from a, 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 a class experience of not being able to pay the rent or the mortgage or anything like that or being on. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I don't in any way denounce them from that because that's not. You know, they've come from different backgrounds, but because they haven't got that experience, I don't think they realise just how insecure people feel about the world at the moment, and how they're living. And I think what we've got to try and educate them on all of that. Can I finish with a joke? Because I'm trying to educate them about how the city works. And some of you will have heard it. My local, uh, I get all these things from local groups. The local Hayes End Methodist Church produce a journal every month, and it always includes a couple of jokes in it. And I, and I assiduously read all these things. And it was about a, a, a parent, a child asked a parent, how does, this, how, how does the city of London work? How does capitalism work? And speculating. And he said, Look, I'll tell you the story. And he said, it's about this Indian chief dies. And his son inherits the chiefdom. And uh, when it gets to the autumn, all the, all the braves and scores come along to him and say, um, is it going to be a cold winter? And he says, well, I don't know. Well, let me think. And he said, but your father always used to tell us whether it was going to be a cold winter. And he said, well, I'm on the spot here. What do I do? So he said, I'll come back to you tomorrow. I'll tell you tomorrow. So he goes away and he phones up um, the weather forecast station. And they say, yeah, well, we think it might be cold. So he goes back to the, the, the trial the next day and says, well, it might be cold. And uh, anyway, they come back next month and tell so are you sure it's going to be cold? And he said, look, leave it with me. So he goes off to the, phones the weather forecast again. He comes back to them. He says, yeah, I think it is going to be cold. It gets to the beginning of December. It's still quite warm. And they come, are you sure it's going to be cold? So he phones up the weather forecast thing without telling them. He phones them up. He says, are you sure? He says to the weather forecast, are you sure it's going to be cold? He said, look, we're absolutely positive. When the Indians start collecting wood like this, it's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> That's how speculators work. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, John.